Sean for being here <laughs> and Meadowlands for giving us this opportunity to talk about regenerative cannabis. Um, we have, not sitting in order, Jesse, who created the Regenerative Cannabis Farm Award with Dan Marr over here, as well as um, Jacob and Carla from Flower Days Farm in Trinity County, Forrest and Patricia from Sunroots Farm in Mendocino County, and Josh from Moongazer Farm in Mendocino County. So <clears throat> these, all of these amazing farmers can tell you guys all about regenerative farming. But before we start that, I just want to let everyone know that the reason I'm here is because I spent years trying to find the dankest weed that I could smoke, and that search led me to these farmers. And their weed really is the dankest. And when I found out that they grow in a way that is actually good for the soil and their watersheds and the bees and the whole ecosystem, I was amazed and inspired. And it's basically the only thing giving me hope for the future right now. But even if I didn't care about the environment or my carbon footprint or the survival of humanity, I would still want to smoke their weed because the flavors and the effects are of a spectacular quality. And from my point of view as a pot snob who cares a lot about quality, I believe that the key to that spectacular dankness is in the relationships between the farmer and the plant and the soil. So I think, <laughs> so Jesse should tell us about the Regenerative Cannabis Farm Award and how it recognizes those connections. Oh, you have one. Great. Well, you know, traditionally in like cannabis cups, we're celebrating the flowers. We're really excited about what's the dankest. And, um, and, I, and I, I agree. I, I think that the dankest practices lead to the dankest flowers. That it is. It's a relationship with the soil, with the land, with community, the art that you put into the flower, biodiversity, healthy environment. Um, that, that comes forth. Um, that makes the flower art. It makes it something that you want to ingest. But like, how do we talk about that? Um, and so, um, with the Emerald Cup and the Cultivation Classic, we created this award called the Regenerative Cannabis Farm Award that recognizes these practices. And we create an application process where we can have farms tell us about them, hear their story. We have a lot of different um, specific things that we ask about so we can know about uh, watershed, we can know about uh, soil practices, closed loop systems, community work, and then we get to set up site visits and go and meet them. And um, recently, this last year, we've been doing um, documentaries with, uh, with Claire of La Osa Films, who's filming right now. Um, and man, they've been coming out so beautiful. They connect uh, the audience with the practices because you can see the animals, you can see the soil, you can see the connection with the land. And it's like, that's the cannabis I want to smoke that's growing from this beautiful soil in polyculture. Um, so it's been this amazing uh, journey the last few years, and one of the coolest parts is you get to meet really amazing friends along the way, and you get to learn a lot. Um, and then you get to feature the best farms, and then now this conversation is out there about the practices. How has cannabis grown? How can we do uh, it better for our environment? How can we do it better for our watersheds and our communities, and, um, and also grow the best cannabis and reduce our costs at the same time? and come together as a community of, of, of sharing information. Um, so we have some amazing uh, farmers here that have, uh, that represent the last two years. Um, three. three years, oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, sorry, three years, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the original here too. I'm re representing Moongazer here too. So the very first year, all three years are represented, so that's amazing. Um, the very first year we had Dragonfly Earth Medicine, Green Source Gardens, and Moongazer Farms. Um, and it's, it's been amazing to see how, how, you know, putting, having them come up on stage, you know, take that award, having people connect with that and seeing the journey of, of that's come from there and the information. Because Josh is, and Sandra have been doing amazing work, con consistently building their land. Uh, every year there's improvement, there's more closed loop systems, there's uh, animals, so much food and polyculture, and now there's twins too, little baby boy twins. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing place of, of life and uh, amazing cannabis and genetics, and it's, it's, a, it's a place of art. And, and I, I really appreciate how much that you've taken on connecting with the community, being at events like this to, to um, continue talking about these practices. And, you know, it's like we all have these abilities to do these things. Um, we can build soil, we can build polyculture, and we can bro grow better cannabis as we do it. Um, 
And the more we talk about it, the more we empower each other, the more we show each other practices. There's not like one way to do something the best. It's each different environment, each different community, you find what works uh, for you. And it's, it's, a, it's a collaborative effort. Um, but yeah, let's, let's hear a little bit about what's going on in your farm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm Josh from Moongazer Farms. Uh, yeah, I mean it's been a it's been a wild journey since uh, 2016. I mean, uh, we we had just actually landed at this property, so we had just started building our hugel culture beds then, and um, just seeing how much life um, is coming through in these beds and 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 all the 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 worms and and uh, activity. I mean, we have just you know the worms are now just kind of going even into like the forest and they're helping even just break down like things in the woods like even faster and stuff too i mean you you create a, a sanctuary on your land that is uh you know is is a haven for for uh, for life you know and and bees and and we're able to do that as small cannabis farmers and if we are able to do it then why shouldn't we do it is kind of how i feel and and you know, if I and as and as a cannabis consumer myself, uh, <laughs> I prefer. Why wouldn't I prefer to have? Well, I prefer to have something that's grown in the soil, in this full sun. Of course, sun gr sun grown in general is better than even a, even indoor, of course. But for me personally. I would like to see it in the full sun. This is where we talk about full spectrum. If we're talking about the highest quality product, I want it to be planted in the spring, and I want it to be harvested in the in the <coughs> in the fall. And we have, and it's and it's going through the entire cycles of nature. You know, and when we're talking about like the moon cycles and the cosmic cycles, this is this is part of just a natural rhythm. Right now, it's spring. Everything's green outside. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of how we're how we're approaching approaching it, and we're just blessed that we're able to grow from seed. We don't have the pressure of having to do a lot of cons you know. I understand people have to grow from clones that come from who knows where, and you need to have a consistent product for the market. I get that, but you know we've been able to figure it out to be able to grow from seed. Um, you know, continue to breed on our land, continue to create strong genetics that are meant for our land. And of course, bring in, you have to bring in genetics too, sometimes from people. So it's nice to have this regenerative network of people because you don't, you don't want to, I don't want to like to inbreed too much too. So that's what's beautiful about this connection that we have with other farmers and stuff too, that we're able to, I got some velvet goo actually growing right now from sunroots that I'm pretty stoked about. And 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 some cherry lime dog from Jesse that's going real strong. Um, I got to get some of that rose lemonade from you guys too. Uh, but yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I stand. And it's so beautiful to have this just the support of the regenerative movement, so that we can really grow in the into in my opinion like the most ideal fashion possible. Um, we still don't make 100% all of our own potting soil, but we're working towards that. Maybe you guys awesome. could talk about it a bit. Well, I just want to mention that I've spent a lot of time in uh, Moongazer's Hugels, and it's really, you can, if, you've, if you've been to a pot farm, you really have not experienced anything like what it feels like to walk around Moongazer's garden, even from, you guys have been building up your soil over the years and it just keeps getting better and better, but even from the first year, even when you were still building them, there already was just bursting with this like vibrant, energetic life force that like just feels so different than, than what you would normally think of as a farm. And watching it grow is really awesome. And watching it just like keep exponentially amplifying and building on itself and watching the goat herd keep getting bigger is really a delight. And these and Josh, is, Josh and his wife Sandra, who's not here, have been super awesome about um, inviting people to come and see what they're doing and like feel that feeling and then take that home with them to their farm. And, I think it's been really beautiful what you've been doing to build community and like holding up that example for everyone. So thanks for that. 
Um, and I was hoping that sun, that um, actually no, Flower Days, that Flower Days would talk to us about their farm and specifically what I think is really, having also gotten to visit your farm, what really stands out is how you guys are very dedicated to keeping things small because you're very focused on these little details that might get lost otherwise. And it like the way that you're approaching it from this boutique standpoint, I was hoping you could tell us about that and how that translates for you. Well, well part of our effort to stay small is also the limitations of the land we work with. So a goal on our farm is to try and explore what what we can how we can cycle nutrients through the land. And so we are keeping animals and the land is also feeding them. It, it's also growing food to feed us. And so through that, we're able to generate enough fertility for what we're working on. And that's a really special thing. Um, basically, since in 1925, farm, farmers were recognizing that soil and nutritional quality of food and medicine were deteriorating. And so this has been a problem for a long time. And so since 1925, it's degraded even further. And so what we're, we need to do is recreate natural cycles of animals consuming, you know, like the coarse fibers that grow on the land, not imported foods, and recirculating that through our farms so that we can rebuild this high nutritional quality. And really that nutritional quality is what's going to give you the quality that you're going to enjoy and, ta and taste in your food and your, in your cannabis. And so, I mean, that's something for all agriculture to start striving for. We don't really have time to start doing anything else and keep getting this fertilizer from Indonesia and this thing from there and these cow bones are from industrial slaughterhouses, but we call it organic. Like, that, that's not progress, you know? And so we're talking about climate change and we have these goals that we're trying to meet. And so what is, what is the answer to that? And like, so for me, I took that really personally. Like I was living in the city and I felt like, dude, my life is, <laughs> this is not, you know, like, um, this is not a solution that I'm being a part of, you know, participating in this huge consumptive society. And so how do we figure out how to, uh, to, to fix that? And, and so we went on a quest for that and we've discovered that the cannabis we were producing was really high quality. And so it's our goal to produce cannabis that goes out and inspires people to keep, to maybe make a change in their life. And, and so that's kind of where we're coming from with staying really small batch on our land. And we hope that as we build our fertility, you know, the batches will grow, but we are, um, we put ourselves in a box so that we could try to think outside of the box. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think in a lot of ways we just really made a lot of changes in our lives because of our, initially because of our personal health and cannabis is very integral to our own healing and our both physical and metaphysical and spiritual healing, I would say. And in our kind of quest to discover what living a sustainable life really means in today's world and how, how we could actually be part of the solution, we, through cannabis, the plant led us to, to Trinity County and to this homesteading community in High and Palm, which is kind of outside of Hayfork. So you get to Hayfork and then you still have to go like 45 more minutes down a windy road and it's on the South Fork of the Trinity River and it's this just epic little valley and there's a lot of beautiful epic little nooks out here and it's, the mountains are steep around us and it's like cannabis just loves to grow there. We have a long outdoor growing season and we can grow all our stuff like Josh is talking about 
doing it through the whole full season and the cycle of nature. And once you start really integrating yourself into nature, you start seeing like, like Caitlin's, Caitlin's talking about how lovely it is to see the goat herd and life exploding everywhere and it's springtime and, and you really witness that right now. And when you start to see that, you realize that, okay, well, we know that it makes our food better. We know it makes our canvas better. We see in the science that everything, nutritionally, all of the terpenes, the whole profile, everything we're looking at, doesn't matter if you're talking about food or, or cannabis, you, you see everything testing higher, better, just more nuance coming out in the flavor especially, but in the nutrition, in the quality. And so for us being small batch, we're a three acre property. And we initially bought a place that needed some work, but from a permaculture perspective, as far as um, a property that you could really work on the soil, work on the uh, design of the land as a whole, and figure out how to turn the farm into a real integrated living organism. And if you can let the biological systems really thrive and build the systems that provide sanctuary, then suddenly you see that life is exploding and that <laughs> you don't have to deal with the problems because they're being dealt with already. Like, you don't have to spray for a pest or you don't see a pest infestation because you have an actually complete ecosystem that is dealing with itself. You have health, and you have health in, a, in another way because you have this joy, and you see, you start to see life really working in a progressive way where it's actually getting better. Things are getting better. And it happens quickly. Remediation happens quickly. Regeneration happens really quickly. Cells rebuild themselves really quickly in the human body. The human gut becomes healthy really quickly. But you have to do the things to make the right environment. And then you see the results and the quality. And for us, it's about the art and it's about the plant, and that's never going to change. And so we can only put so much energy in, and, and on three acres, you can do what you can do on three acres, but we're not planting three acres of cannabis. We live on that three acres. Our animals live from that three acres, and we grow all our food on that three acres. We grow all our animals' food on that three acres. We're getting there, you know. We... We have things we source sometimes locally, and that's the other really integral part of it, is that it's a larger ecosystem that you're a part of. You're one part, you're a living biological system, your farm is, and then it's part of another localized ecosystem, and we need to work in our localized communities for resources, because they're abundant, and if we use our surpluses that we have on a small scale to supply each other, like hay fork can all <laughs> needs to grow a lot more hay because we need a lot more <laughs> local organic straw mulch. It's actually frustrating to try and source things sometimes, which is why we went to the point of realizing like we need to be self-reliant enough to not have to import anything. And so that's what we're striving for, ultimately. And what that does for the quality, too, is it builds your terroir. It actually makes your specific characteristics of your soil and your land and the place where you live come out. And there's a story behind each place. And, you know, we really understand that to a pretty sophisticated level in wine. But as far as cannabis, we still have a lot of education and people need to actually experience it to know it and understand it and that's part of what terroir means it's you know the the place and the characteristics of that place that give the product that's being cultivated there whether it be wine or cheese or cannabis i mean there's appellations we were just talking earlier about appellations for chamomile and there's an amazing terpene in chamomile, which we found in some of our strains were really prevalent, and it's, it's part of what makes it calming. It's 
part of why it makes the high so amazing. I mean, there's so much nuance to it. That's the art behind it, and that's why it's so fun to be a farmer. And what we really need more of, actually, is scientists to come out to the farm and help us continue to collect collect data because it's a lot to manage and um, that's something we could really you know use some collaboration with people um, doing that kind of work suggestion <laughs> I just got a, a weather station and they're not that expensive and it constantly just updates data but it's just a great tool to be able to put right in your uh, gardening your cultivation location and uh, get the the radiation, the temperature, the humidity. You can get them with soil probes too, get um, temperature. You can set up game cams and like really like pay attention to everything and the, the rhythms of the plants uh, with the environment. But it's cool just to have it. You can look on your phone at any time and see I mean, we, it we love updated. That. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so those, those closed loops, the, the looking at the farm as a whole, uh, we had a really good example this uh, trip up to Oregon um, and our winners this year, Lane Creek Hemp. Um, they do full hugel cultures. Um, they have animals on site, lots of different like llamas and sheep and goats and pigs. Um, they grow about 27 acres, I think, of, uh, of straw that's feed for the, the animals. And so they've, they've actually fully closed that loop. And it's kind of interesting just like looking at this land and seeing the way water moves and energy moves and the way they've done like small things that are gonna like lead to really big thriving changes and just with how energy flows, how water flows and putting the things in the right place for a system to build itself. And then building diverse uh, polyculture, both in the soil diversity and in the plants that you're growing. And when you're doing that, you're bringing up all of this all this ability to process nutrition, when you have a diverse biology in the soil, it's able to uh, you know, eat whatever is there and make it available for the plants. And then all these different plants are able to bring all these different minerals and nutrition up and they bring it to the surface and then that's mulching back in and it's just constantly building soil. And when you're part of that process, you're part of sequestering carbon to create something that, that leads to nutrition. And it's a system that just thrives and thrives and thrives. And you're able to make an economic product at the same time. Something that has value that, that, you know, that people get jobs based off of, that feed family. And you're literally improving the environment. Like, how amazing is that? There's very little thing, few things in the world, like, of business that actually don't have, you know, dramatic negative effects on the environment. And regenerative agriculture is one of those things that, that do... And most of agriculture is horribly destructive. And so the more we support small farmers that build soil, that build polyculture, that reach out to community, that provide really good products, uh, that's what we need to do as, as a society. Um, so support these farmers up here. Thank you for coming to things like this and believing in this. I was just going to say real quick, uh, the, in the regenerative cannabis calendar I just saw for this month, the the Strafaria uh, post, there there was a lot of info about it that I hadn't known about how it benefits the bees even. So with the King Strafaria mushroom, you're benefiting the bees, you're growing food, you're sequestering carbon, and that's that's a really, that's a fine tenant of regenerative cannabis. It, so he's referring to uh, so mushrooms, wood-eating mushrooms, they, uh, oh, okay. yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, we're going to hear it. <laughs> Once Jesse starts talking about closing loops, it's hard to... <laughs> well, I think everything that we're saying about um, systems and all these things integrating really speaks to what, for me, is the real differentiator between these farmers and most farmers is this um, attitude of, like, instead of, like, you're the master farmer and you're looking down at your farm and everything is like your responsibility and if there's a pest problem, you have to solve it. It's seeing there's this incredibly powerful, larger force and it's like working within that and creating the environment that's necessary to let these forces do what they need to do is just a much more powerful and, and effective um, approach, I think. And that's what really makes all of the, any whether it's cannabis or produce, stand out when it comes out of these kinds of gardens. So I think Sunroots should tell us about how they do that to make especially really beautiful, enormous, crazy colored, cool looking plants in particular, but also just really nutritious and good for the soil and all that stuff too. <laughs> 
Thank you. You guys are all amazing, and everyone here for being here. Thank you so much for taking the time to care. It matters. It matters to care. Everything that we do makes a difference. Uh, I'm Patricia, and speaking on kind of what you were saying, Caitlin, about uh, not looking down on your farm as if it's you're the master gardener because there's no hierarchy in the garden. Um, there is something I always want to speak on when we talk about regenerative agriculture is that, um, yeah, letting go of control in the garden and letting go of control in a way that helps you to open your, your eyes and your perspective to what you may not see when you have all these ideas and all these structures in front of you. And when you let go t in the garden, you're listening more. And that's my biggest thing on regeneration is that we're here not as controllers, but as servants to this earth, really. I see myself as this like, okay, mama earth, like I will do this, I will continue working hard and, and for my community and for everything that I stand for, it's not easy work. It's intensive, labor intensive, you know, mentally, physically, spiritually, you're in it all the time and it's a commitment. And you know, we're human, so we're, it's wonderful to make mistakes because we learn and grow from them. But yeah, regeneration in the garden, again, and just in our lives that we're, we're all, need to do our part and empower each other and, and support these kind of small farms and support the lifestyle of, of helping one another out because not only are we regenerating our land and working our soils and building and building every part of the year, we're building up soil because the work is not really ever done. Uh, so you continue doing things and as you build up in that, you build up in other parts of yourself where you can be better for the world and be better for the environment because right now we need all these earth stewards to come forward like you're all powerful each one of us has so much power to really make a difference in this world and yeah we're all these little small farmers in these mountain areas way out there but wherever you are you make a difference so with your little gardens you know plant what you can and even if it's in a container in a patio in the city that's fine do do our part and i'll let forrest talk about big plants because this man <laughs> is like i always praise him up but just yeah i walked into his farm five years ago and it's changed a lot since then we have a lot more flowers and the everything is building and building um we're basically building compost piles for every single plot of land. We have 10 by 10s um, where we just keep adding the manure, adding the straw, adding mushroom, mycelium, wood chips, adding plants, chop and drop. Um, that is definitely a big creation of the larger plants and also the genetics that, that we're working with are local. Um, and I'll let Forrest get into it more, but thank you all for listening. Thank you. Yeah, so diversity is one of our main things that we try to focus on, having as many types of plants and uh, as we can around the, the, the ganja and giving space and the vision to seeing how, you know, if you're going to grow a big plant, you need to like envision at the end, you know, giving it enough space so it has that potential to get to where you want it to go and uh, just keep building the soil up layer by layer and having those natural, you know, uh, systems to help you on the way. So Can we maybe get some context for when you say big plants, what that means in case people <laughs> haven't seen your plants. <laughs> uh, last year, the, l the largest one was like 20 pounds. They're 16, yeah, 16 feet. Uh, 20 pounds. 20 pounds dried. Yeah. Normally Wait, I call yeah. bullshit, but I saw these plants. It's insane, <laughs> dude. Like, they're beautiful. Like, that one was grown tree. on, like, a, uh, a compost pile of old weed, like, st stems and stalks. But, like, yeah, the, ma the majority of them were 10 plus, you know. 
these these are all strains that I've been breeding myself, you know, on the farm for years. So, no, not twenty feet high, not quite that big. How wide? Probably like twelve feet wide by, you know, thirteen, fourteen feet tall. You know. 16, yeah. If you yeah. go to regenerativecannabisfarming.org, there's videos that you can link to that walk you walk through these monster plants. It's it's all it's about how many bud sets, the the density of the the colas, um, and how happy they are. You know, if you're giving them the right nutrients and an adequate amount of water. You know, we we have uh, drip systems that go you know once around the base and then around you know the big part of you know the mass amount of the soil that we have and uh so like they pull out water when they need it and you know have as much nutrients as they need also so available, available. so you know throughout their course of growing all all i have to do is go out there with a hose and like do a hand water to like feed them extra food you know i don't have to add anything else Everything else, everything that they need is in the soil already. So, will you walk us through the soil building and composting process? <laughs> well, that's like a yearly process. Like in the fall, we uh, we prep the beds uh, by laying more more straw and covering any bare spots. Um, and then in this in this uh, and then we throw out cover crops too. So you know during the winter, there's cover crops that are growing. And then uh, in the springtime, you know, we cut the cover crops and add, bring in more uh, more manure, uh, locally sourced, and our own. You know, we have alpacas, so they're really good uh, adding nutrients. They have a uh, high phosphorus. Is so phosphorus or potassium? It's phosphorus. Yeah. In have, We're in Coblo, uh, California, Mendocino, so two hours inland from here. But I just want to say about the alpacas that they are amazing because they have communal dung piles and they are really hygienic and they are light on the earth. Uh, they don't eat as much, they don't drink as much, and they're less harmful in ways that livestock can be. So that's one of our... You, we don't milk them, just the, we, the little creas, the baby alpacas, we let them have all the milk. And um, I think you can, though. The camelid uh, milk is ap apparently very delicious, but we haven't tried it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in the springtime, then we bring, we pretty much make a pile of manure, right, in each plot where we're going to put one plant. So each plant gets a pile of manure. <laughs> uh, and then what was I going to say uh, no till so if anything we have these uh, meadow forks meadow creatures they're great broad forks so if you want to loosen up your soil you have, a, you have those to do a little bit of mixing if you need to uh, other than that you know that's pretty much it. Uh, just pruning the plant up when, when like three or four times during the grow cycle, uh, caging them really well because right where we have we have uh, lots of strong wind, and they'll blow your plants right down if you don't have them uh, uh, fence post in. You know we have T posts on each corner, and then a cage going up, you know two feet high off the ground so we can actually you know support the plant well and then we'll have to like do a third cage at the end right before the you know they're they're done you know in august september we're third caging it so it's a big process uh but it's totally seeds? worth oh yeah we start our seeds in february second week in february second third week in february so you know ha having that whole process of uh you know from springtime all the way till fall so these plants are sucking in all this energy from the the cosmos and the and the ground all that n nutrients and uh you know just making a real medicine for the people you know and that's what it's about you know we're all we're all growing medicine so and that's the most important thing keeping the cannabis sacred so that's how we feel thank you <laughs> thanks so much um, I was hoping that we could maybe get a little bit more into 
kind of explaining what's going on in the soil that you guys are creating because for me um, as I was like visiting farms like these guys and, and really starting to understand what makes them so special, that was like a big light bulb moment for me was like, oh, living soil. That's really what it comes down. It's like no till, living soil, going to a farm and having having Jesse say, look at look at this soil. Look at my soil. Look at these worms. Look at these spiders. And he's like, oh, my God, my <laughs> worms are amazing. So I think you know we can talk about like how you build your soil, and that's really valuable information for people that are going to do it. But just for anyone that's going to consume cannabis or buy cannabis or sell it, like what is live like what makes living soil different than, you know, what a bagged soil with maybe, you know, you can put nutrients in it, but what makes that no-till living soil uh, special and different than, than other, than dirt? It's connected to everything and it has like an infinite potential of life energy. Um, as far as like building it, like there's no like, this is a way to build soil or make some super soil. It's like working with your environment and what makes sense, you know, like certainly cover cropping and mulching, working with animals and, and building biodynamic compost and, and integrating that back in. Uh, Hugel cultures, burying wood, creating dynamic uh, spaces with organic matter that's like tons of different types of foods for very diverse microbes and continually building on that diversity and adding more organic matter and as you do that you just draw more and more life and you know it's not just about like we're talking about the the uh, bacteria and the, the fungi but uh, when you're seeing a lot of the um, larger bugs you know the centipedes and little soil mites and all kinds of fun things uh, worms and like there's all this nutrient cycling that's happening you're like you just think about how much energy is happening to constantly have these more and more critters that are like moving around eating and pooping and and they're just building more and more soil and they're all just doing their own thing uh you like feeding themselves but they're all improving everything you know as they do their thing you know they all have their specialized way and you know i kind of see that as part of this regenerative movement is like paying attention to like you know, all those bugs are building soil and they're doing their own thing, you know, like how we can all kind of connect like that and, and put carbon in the ground and build living soil and grow good things out of that. Um, you know, the same with, with um, mutualistic relationships of any kind with plants, with, with soil biology. Uh, you know, cannabis roots, there. cannabis is a mutualistic organism. That's how it like evolves. It's very smart. So it knows how to uh, give other organisms what it wants. And so the main process that's happening on uh, the, the roots is, is this exudate exchange where uh, the roots of the plant are, are, they have all of this energy from the sun that they can turn into carbohydrates and they can feed different bacteria in the soil. They can feed different fungi. Those fungi have the enzymes that can then break down other minerals in the soil. The plant can f uptake that and it becomes this cycle where the soil biology thrives, the plant thrives, all the energy is coming from the sun, the carbon gets stored in the ground, and it's a system that continually builds and builds and builds, and what's left behind is soil. Um, so, like, yeah, those are the processes to mimic, and that's what plants have evolved to uh, have their best health with. Uh, just like us eating a healthy diet, like eating a farmer's market, you know, eating our own food, uh, a plant growing from insect poop and fungi and in, in well-developed and aerated because like worms are moving through and because the fungi clumps things together, we have aggregated soil that allows the right amount of air, that allows the right amount of organisms to have an environment to all thrive. And it just continues and continues. And that's gonna give birth or give rise to the best, uh, you know, health, the best uh, in the plant and then the best cannabis and terpene production at the end. So that's why if you uh, buy soil and then throw it away at the end of the season, that is incorrect and should not be your well, approach. <laughs> well, the soil, you know, it, it should just be this thing that you're like constantly like improving and adding to. And it's like, and your, and it's, like it's the most valuable thing you have, so you know, and if we all like life. think about that, like that's where everything of value comes from, that we grow all of our nutrition. That's what keeps us healthy. Like, and if every person you know, like their space, like thinks about that soil and say a sacred and something that they can make thrive more and more every year. You're sequestering carbon and you're bringing health to the world. What is it? But how easy it is 
Oh, so easy. Yeah, no, I, all kinds of things. You know, compaction, uh, bare soil, the sun beating down, uh, having water go over incorrectly, uh, spraying anything, uh, doing any kind of salt nutrients, uh, pH going off. Uh, there's all kinds of things that, you know, you make like a change and the biology is very specific, especially different bacteria for a very specific environment. So the pH gets thrown off, the salt balance gets thrown you have a total die out of a certain thing and then that throws a whole cycle off so like you have to be really careful of not um, allowing any kind of collapse in your soil biology and using things like that you know keeping it protected don't over compact don't leave things bare don't every you know don't use salt nutrients don't use pesticides <laughs> um thank you for explaining that to us <laughs> um so when I started smoking cannabis that came out of this kind of soil and realized how different it was than the cannabis that I might have previously been smoking, it pretty quickly made me realize that I only wanted to eat food that was coming out of living soil also because the difference is so dramatic. And then that kind of means you have to start growing your own food and building your own soil if you want that. Um, but I think a big part of all of your gardens is like that is the same soil is providing your food that you eat. Like you're not going to spray pesticide on your cannabis because you are dedicated to what you're doing and you know that's wrong. But also like that's your food that you're eating is coming from right right there. So I was hoping maybe anyone who wants to speak to it or all of you could talk about just what it's like to have that kind of connection. Like it's not just like this is my job, this is my cash crop. It's like, this is my life, this is my food, this is everything. And that's, I think, a really magical relationship that not very many people nowadays have gotten to see or experience. And it, it really, like, it really colors, like, your whole existence, I think, when you are doing that and eating eating the food that's coming out of those pugil beds or those, those beds. So does anybody want to talk about their food that they grow? <laughs> I'll start because I think um, the change we made in our lives m basically saved my life from a health perspective, I think. I don't know where I would be if I hadn't started seeking f the answers to, like, what am I eating and, <laughs> and, and sourcing. I mean, the city sourcing your food is... It, took, it would take me all week, and I had certain farmers at the farmer's market, and I knew exactly how they grew their food. And they nourished me and kept me alive. But I think it's really important that, you know, ultimately the solutions are solutions to a lot of things. And if we're only focused on profits for the sake of profits, and we're not taking into account the people or the planet and their health, like for real, like th the quality of the life, then what are we really gaining? And for how long is that even sustainable? And we don't have the time to waste anymore to be playing that game and I'm not interested in playing it. I'm not interested in buying anything or consuming anything that does, doesn't take these things into account. And so for me, it was like a big life choice in a lot of ways that led me to be a cannabis farmer in a remote valley in Northern California where I'm growing all my own food. But to know what it tastes like, to go to a high-end palm potluck, there's like the saying that like once you've been to a high-end palm potluck, you're like ruined forever because you could go to like the best restaurant in Paris or wherever and you're just going to be like, mm, yeah, it's pretty good or you could appreciate the chef or if you go to a place that's really farm to table like r for real and you can really appreciate it but there's nothing like homegrown so like one thing is if you can grow it in your backyard I hope you will and the other is that it's luc it is lucrative to support sustainable business that's based on health and well-being of everybody involved and that's mutually beneficial. And it's really important that we start thinking that way because if we don't, where are we going and how does, that, how does anybody really win otherwise? And it's just like, we were just like, there's no more time to waste. We're just gonna like die 
like where I'm dying. I can feel myself dying. I'm like not even that old. This is fucked up, you know? So like, what are we going to do about it? And oh, look at these mycelium in the woods. They like found their way indigenous microorganisms to this crazy plastic that some cartel left here. And they're like eating it and turning it into soil. And like, if you just build it, they will come. So like, like seeing the microbiology on our just three acres and what it could do to our ecosystems. I mean, we can reverse climate change if we practice regenerative agriculture. It's very simple. I don't even know what the original question was. I'm sorry. I'm so um, Just how, uh, how so eating much. food that you grow. <laughs> okay, so I think I covered it. Okay. You answered it very well. And also, uh, uh, going back to the no-till growing our food in this system is is very unconventional in terms of agriculture. Uh, having the, this, this constant supply of, of luscious, you know, loamy, amazing living soil for, for your food. I mean, we're going through this right now. My, you know, we, my wife just had two babies and there's a whole, there is this, you know, in terms of milk production and lactation, all this kind of stuff. I mean, there is a real nutrient uh, like food sort of science to all that, you know, I mean, we're harvesting like stinging nettles out of our garden. Uh, and these are all things that are growing in like a no-till nutrient dense uh, style. And, and it's real and you can really feel it. And, and it goes, I know I spoke about worms in the beginning, but it, you know, there's all kinds of life. There's all different kinds of earthworm castings are wonderful, but then you have the, insect frass from the pill bugs and I mean it goes even all the way to hummingbird poop I mean there's probably some special compound in that and we're attract <laughs> and we're attracting them with the, with certain flowers that we grow uh, next to our plants you know so it just creating creating good life is where it's at I wanted to tap in and just say too like to be real also with not all of us have access to being on a farm and up in the mountains. Like, you live in the city, you live in the city, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, and fi I think it's important to find your strengths and where you are, you know? Like, our strength is growing food, but that's not everybody's lifestyle. So you go out and you support the people who support you back in, in turn, you know, where you guys have a mutually benefiting um, relationship. And also um, diversifying with different foods and medicine, I think it's so important to talk about. Not many people talk about this in cannabis. I feel like, you know, herbal medicine, there's all these other herbs and sacred flowers and food is medicine and everything that's growing is basically medicinal all around us. And when we can combine the intake of cannabis with uh, different herbs that we're either growing or sourcing from someone that we know who's growing them. Um, I grow them if anyone is ever interested in herbs uh, because I, I believe that we have to blend up the different medicinal values of each plant so you're not only receiving anti-inflammatory and adaptogenic properties from one plant, but you're receiving it from multiple different sources so that your medicine is actually now enhanced and more diversified. And it's all about that. It always comes down to that, how we can diversify everything around us, our culture, our communities and ourselves um, internally it's it's I think it's an important balance to have Absolutely. thank you so much for bringing up um, the importance of diversity and I think that really comes through across like the soil the companion planting growing your own food all of it it's really like diversity is a huge part of every regenerative farm I think and when I see like a big monoculture now it makes me just really sad and it looks dead to me um, because it's like the diversity of all the different plants in one hugel bed or in one space, and then the diversity of all the different types of life that are going on in the soil. I think all of that comes together in this amazing symphony. Um, and I thought it would be nice to hear, you mentioned that, um, Patricia, you mentioned that you didn't always have so much things besides cannabis growing in the cannabis garden, and now you guys have more flowers and more all different kinds of things. And I was wondering if you have noticed um, changes you know, changes in the space, changes in the cannabis after increasing more different types of life. Absolutely. Um, one of the parcels that we're on is actually was planted 20 years prior 
with um, by a, a woman who created a wildlife sanctuary. So we had one half of the property that's like amazing, thriving, plum trees, fruit trees, everything that nature and all these birds and bats want. Um, and then on our side of the property, when we moved there, um, it was a long progress because most of it was uh, just cattle, ranching, you know, our area is ag land. So a lot of ranchers around there and it's all flat. All the trees have been kind of in the valley. What was it? It used to be a swamp. Yeah, it was more grassland. More grassland. Yeah. And then um, it all got fenced off. So what we had to do was sheet mulch and Sheet mulching is beautiful because you can start with like a grab a piece of like land of gravel where nothing's growing at all and you just start adding the layers of soil and two years later or even months later months later months. I mean three months later you can see the difference in the soil you can put your hand in and it's soft and it's it's workable um, but years later and I'm talking about now I mean the amount of flowers and and thriving native um, plants and uh, trees. The birds are crazy. Like people who stay over our house, they're like, oh my God, why are these birds so happy in the morning? Like 5 a.m. they're going off and you can't sleep anymore, but uh, unless you're used to it like me and you can sleep through it. But yeah, it's just, you're creating like a paradise, an ecosystem that is literally paradise. Like, if you can imagine the most beautiful place that you would want to go to, I'm sure it has flowers and gardens and edibles and fruit that you can just pick off trees that drips on you, and it's divine. That's what we're striving for, is just making this paradise, and I, it, we keep spreading it wider and wider and wider, and that's what we do with each other, too, hopefully. <laughs> What's amazing with the herbs and uh, medicinal plants is just growing them with cannabis, you, you improve uh, your pest situation, like big time. Having yarrow, having uh, basil, oregano, uh, lavender, all these different herbs that are really easy to grow that just kind of take off on their own that you want to have in your garden anyway. Uh, chamomile and love itch. Like they're bringing in all these different... Um, insects that keep the the whole system in balance and i almost never see uh out of control you know out of balance pest issues in gardens with a huge amount of polyculture so last year we had aphids for the first time they showed up and all of a sudden they were like all over in certain parts of the garden and it was kind of uh unnerving for a minute and then you know what do you do you know, no, we're not going to spray chemicals on them. So we did a little research. Um, she found out that spraying milk on them helps. Um, so we started doing that. And then, you know, the beneficial bugs, these little uh, cipher flies, the hoover, hoover flies, they started laying their larvae on, on the uh, plants. And I was like, what the heck? What are these little larvas on here now? I have all sorts of bugs. It's like it's like a haven for all you know all these types of new bugs that I uh, it's like whoa so he's like why'd you make us plant all these flowers here <laughs> like this is ruining it <laughs> but then then we find out that that they're uh, you know they're going around and eating these uh, aphids and I'm like taking the aphids and putting them in front of the little uh, larva and watching them devour and I'm, I'm like yeah yeah that's awesome and then I see the aphid uh, population diminishing off of certain plants, you know, like all, some of them almost like, you know, 100 percent. And so it's pretty amazing to see like this uh, actually working and, you know, the garden just taking care of itself, you know. So having that diversity is very crucial. And, uh, you know, just having fruit trees around and you know, being able to pick your fruit with, your, you know, as you smell your buds and, you know, it's, it's all, it's just, you having like a garden of Eden around you, you know, it's just, that's all, I think what we all want, so. And I think um, that gives a really different, uh, like seeing that, seeing those systems work and seeing how quickly they can work and how the garden can sort of take care of itself when it has the appropriate amount of diversity. Uh, it seems to make make you guys all a lot more calm than a lot of people who are managing a garden. Like well, I've been in Josh's. It takes patience. 
developing and, that patience and, it, and that calm really it comes and through in panicking. everything you do the and, not panicking exactly. and also you start to learn you know these plants and the animals and the insects they're not just like working for us they're beings of their own independent nature that deserve our love and respect and we can't get along well without them and so if we keep farming in ways that hurt these creatures we're in big trouble yeah let's get along with the creatures i've been in i've been in moon gazer's garden a bad. lot of times <laughs> and seen they, because like i said you guys always have just different people coming through and checking out the garden and so i always see we're always walking through the garden and someone's coming through and they're like oh josh i just found something here I, there's you got a bugs here there's some stuff growing here <laughs> and every time he's so chill they're like oh, oh look out and these are you know experienced farmers not just random people that are like oh my god a bug like they're experts that know what they're talking about they're like uh oh you got something to worry about here and every single time you just let it roll right you're like oh hmm, someone will come along and eat that like it's just so chill and your weed is amazing and it does not get all eaten by bugs so it seems like it's working to just not not stress out about that there's definitely an element of trusting in nature that that it'll 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 work out and um and observing and yeah. Well, yeah, biological intelligence is amazing. And I mean, it's very <laughs> nuanced. And so you have to know what you're looking at, for sure. And sometimes you have to constantly be doing research and we need to be really connected in our communities because, you know, just in agriculture, like new things come in as like, it's actually the, because of hemp blowing up that we saw these new aphids for the first time on cannabis. The, they're hemp aphids that crossed over. So anyway, um, there's always going to be something new to deal with, and it's always changing. And but but biological intelligence is very nuanced, and it's it's something that you don't want to be ever fighting against. And actually, if you just really constantly observe and really work with its own balance. Balance, it doesn't mean you're always perfectly on a straight line in the middle like this. That's not how it works. Balance is fluid and biological intelligence allows for a natural course of life to walk that line in a way that's actually fluid. And that's, that's what life means. And, that, and so when you're creating as the farmer, that creation, that's what life is about. It's creative. And so ultimately we are the innovators. We are the ones that are that come before the science. The science is, a, is what we're doing, but then the numbers just are ways we can measure and demonstrate and prove what we are discovering. And so the discovery and the creation, that's what life is doing. And the biological intelligence, there's more and more and more and more and more to it, the more to it that you uncover and the more that you learn. And so that's what's exciting about our job. But the other thing is we really need to build space where we can be working in this way in agriculture. And the, it, it is, possible to create both abundance, well-being, health for the planet and the people, and have lucrative, sustainable system. So I think that's really important that our industry be guiding this because we've been doing this work. There's research in Korea. There's like um, 100 years of research from Germany and other places. And we're one of the pe places in the United States and this part of kind of the Western Hemisphere that you know, in cannabis, th th we've been doing this because our way of life, kind of the plant, all of it leads to us asking these questions. And so, as an industry, how can we really uh, support the fact that we are, <laughs> in a lot of ways, the innovators and, and part of the people that are doing some really creative work around what can happen positively in agriculture and with this plant? So I hope we'll all kind of continue to really think about, regardless, like Patricia said, of where you live, um, how we can support those systems in our regions because they're really important to the sustainability of our, of our cities and of our future in general. So 
I was going to say, and socially also promoting diversity as a form of, of resilience. When people come out to our farm and we have, you know, last year we had about, we had at one point like 20 visitors at one time came from CDFA because they're coming up with um, their, uh, you know, their ways of looking at things. And, uh, and there was a couple of farmers there too. And one farmer said like, oh, aren't you, are you worried about, you know, pests coming over or, um, you know, and, and it's, it doesn't really become an issue when you have the balanced ecosystem and, and resilient, resilient nature mimicking sort of farm that we can create. I just want to say, I want to smoke the flowers that come from the farms where they're paying attention to which plant had uh, hummingbird poop on it and which plant, you know, and, and just noticing the aphids and that there be, you know, that the hoverfly started eating them. Like that kind of nuance, like in connection with your landscape and your flowers, uh, there's no way to replicate that. Um, it's something that's really special. It's something that's art and it's something that we should really um, do everything to support. Agreed. <laughs> Um, well, I think there's probably a lot of things that you guys could share that are valuable because you're always learning and discovering new things. Um, so I don't if there's anything that uh, that we haven't touched on that feels important to to share, and then we can have questions after that. Anything we missed? <laughs> well, I'd like to encourage it everyone to go to the website regenerativecannabisfarming.org um, you can learn about these farms there's cool photo galleries and movies and uh, a lot of information about practices and resource links cool awesome well does anybody have any questions that they want to ask these farmers regenerativecannabisfarming.org the regenerative farming is uh, is that standalone on its own or who is that sponsored by where does that stem from yeah, it's it's a project that uh, I do with Dan Marr. It's um, just a way of uh, evaluating uh, farms based on their ecological oh, okay. and, and community standards. It's something that we just uh, do independently for both the uh, Emerald Cup and the Cultivation Classic for um, awarding farms based off okay, the practices. Okay, cool. Yeah, that was my question. Awesome. But it's independent, yeah. High Tide Permaculture and Biovortex. It's very grassroots. <laughs> I just had a question. Um, as a like city dweller, um, I have a small garden, and I was just wondering how to even get started in introducing like uh, beneficial bugs to my crops, and where I would get that, and like how to get smaller uh, sizes. Like I don't need a thousand bugs, you know, for my little small garden. So. Uh, just build compost and build a bunch of fl and create, create a habitat. bunch of flowers. Create okay. habitat for them to come, and they'll come. Cool. So plant flowers, you know move some lo sticks, logs around, or get some wood chips. And there's a lot of availability of resources in urban areas to do interesting permaculture projects. So. Look up Hugel culture beds, too, and do a mini Hugel culture. You might have fun with that in the yard. It's always fun, too, to look at um, n native plants in your area because that attracts the native pollinators and bees and bugs that you might want. Yeah, if, if you can uh, do some research, look for a native plant nursery in your area, and, and there'll be an awesome resource to let you know how to you know, give a habitat for the bugs that are best for that particular area. Hey, um, so I work in a nursery, and a lot of the people that I interact with have indoor grows that try to be very sterile and use a lot of really unsustainable practices, and I feel like everyone knows they can't last forever, but I'm curious what you guys think a path toward being more sustainable indoors could look like. Hmm. Well, sustainable, uh, as far as pest control, um, I think like a, a lot of people have pretty good luck just doing common things like mineral oils and sulfur and, and, then, um, and then introducing biological controls like the bugs that might eat the next one. Uh, but that's a very controlled, it's just such a different world, the indoor environment. Uh, because it's like the opposite of what we're doing. You know, we're attracting as much life as possible and you're trying to kind of control it indoors. But biological control is 
do work well. And, and living soil works super well indoors, and you don't have to replace it, and it gets better and better. There's a lot of really good examples of people doing, like, 30 cycles, and it just improves every time. I always pictured, like, the most ideal indoor situation would be, like, with solar panels, and you had some animals maybe grazing outside, and you could use that, like material to compost your beds and stuff like that and do like a no-till indoor style and like if you check out check out green life productions over in nevada they have some cool uh indoor techniques that they use um there's lots of micro mycological life and stuff like that in there and it's uh there's a way to do it i think and there are also quite a few plant-based pesticide products on the market that could be alternatives. Um, there's definitely, I know one called SNS 209, which ha is basically a rosemary extract. It's a pet, and it's like generally recognized as safe food grade product that is a, is a pesticide you water in made out of rosemary and that's it. So there are definitely options for, for consumers to support you know, regeneratively grown products if you choose not to make it yourself like um, we do. And I think some of that is definitely worth supporting, you know. I think it's cool to see um, in places where indoor is the only legal option, people exploring companion planting and no-till living soil in an indoor environment. But I think that the best way to improve an indoor grow is to take the roof off and then take the walls off and then take the floor away. Yeah. We have to remember that the reason we grow indoors is not because it's superior or more clean. It's because helicopters used to fly over and you could get you could get away with it. You know, that's the only reason we grow indoors. Why would you ever eat a tomato grown indoors? Are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> who eats tomatoes grown indoors and prefers indoor tomatoes? Like, well, and to no, grow your own medicine in you your know. own house, not everyone has a farm to be able to do that. So a lot of And, and for providing yourself medicine, it, it definitely makes sense. But to commercially be, be using this much energy, I think, I... I don't know. I heard some outrageous statistics about how much fossil fuels go into an indoor pound. That's just like. It's like the whoa. equivalent of a server, of a server center. Yeah, it's like it's pretty terrible. <laughs> so we need to fix that. There's, we don't really, there's no excuses anymore. Agreed. Or at least not for us, because we have the environment to do it, and we sh we need we should be celebrating that and and doing that because we can now and there aren't, I mean, there are actually, that's not true, there are still helicopters flying over, but that's a longer story and not, not a, what this panel <laughs> is about anyway, so. I had a friend um, who, you know, grew pretty traditionally, you know, whatever worked kind of style yeah. um, and, you know, he was pretty good at it and he definitely knows cannabis well, but he's doing a nursery and, um, He's all he's been all excited, like calling me the last like several months is like constantly like, oh, my God, I'm doing so much less work. I'm not like because he's gone totally organic and he's do just done natural predators for his nursery. And like there's no spray. And it's just like I don't have to hire anyone. I don't have to do anything. The plants are happier than I've ever seen. And, you know, he's doing larger uh, amounts of uh, cl kind of classic, uh, you know, hype strains and stuff like that, too. And, and keeping them clean just with, uh, you know, organic and biological control. So it's cool to see that. Style. Next question. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm going to start off by uh, saying that I'm vegan and I'm very regenerative. So these questions might come uh, a little bit more of a reality check for, for me anyway. 80% of the cannabis uh, that's consumed is grown indoors. And so the 20%, which is where the beautiful, uh, also gets pricing that's much lower and often much better quality. So I think there's got to be a way to bridge that gap um, and be, become more plant-centric, for sure. Um, and you don't need an example of that with regards to different kinds of uh, uh, adding you know, additives that you might do, whether it's chemicals, salts, whatever, because you can look right around you and see this beautiful, that really doesn't have Monsanto here, doesn't have, you know, a peat number XXX. It does it on its own. It's been doing it for years, right? I think the issue is how do we, uh, the sun is extremely important. 
as we all know, the UV factor. So no matter whether you put it on a greenhouse <clears throat> or you do it uh, indoors, the issue is you're not getting UV. And UV is so significantly important for pest control as well as compound development. And outside, we can get so much more compound, so much more medicine. It's all medicine, whether you're getting high on it or not, it's medicine. So my question <laughs> is, I see a lot of camaraderie. <clears throat> I certainly do, and that's one of the reasons I came, because I want to be centered in the, the, the kind of souls that are here. But where's the collaboration in fighting off that 80% grow and fighting from a quality perspective, from a land race perspective, being able to buy the true medicines that are available to us, not just in cannabis and psychedelics and, 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 but grown in a way <clears throat> not only that you are a servant to Mother Nature, but that you produce the best, highest quality because they will find you. So my question is what strains or what plants, what are the plans of the group here to differentiate yourself in the marketplace with a quality product that no matter what other people make, they know you, your farm, for that? How, how is it that you're going to do this against this huge machine uh, that's going to be branding and they're going to do everything else, they're going to poison it and I do this often and, and I'm sorry for this, I'm getting on a soapbox. I figure that everything that's not done the way you do it is poison cannabis, it truly is poison cannabis. In this way we extract it, what bioaccumulates in our body along with the chemicals that you use to grow it, which also is in the plant. So the question is, how do we collaborate in a way to be able to change that balance a little bit? Because we all know in our heart, the cannabis growing out there in living soil outdoors is going to produce the best medicine uh, and high. So how would you guys go around doing that? Well, that is the point of the Regenerative Cannabis Farm Award. Like at, at the heart, like that's the concept. It's like the getting this out there uh, at, at the Emerald Cup. You have 4,000 people on stage looking up, and we're showing the movies connecting the uh, farms with the animals, the soil, the polyculture, the community work, and they see it. And, and then you know, connecting them with the flowers after that, too. And uh, we had a, a really cool uh, flower testing, too, and... You did these amazing reviews, Certified Dank, uh, did amazing reviews of all the different flowers. So each different farm uh, put in like two different uh, samples and they were, they were all got these really fun, uh, elaborate wine type reviews that were actually quite on point because I'm very familiar with a lot of them. I was like, wow, that's really, really good. Um, very specific. It would almost be fun if you read one of those. Um, but the more that we like kind of have that the, the practices be the subject and the more we communicate also with dispensaries there's certain dispensaries like soulful that really do push forward these practices they have the um you know come meet the farmers and so then the consumers get to connect with you know see pictures talk to the farmers know the practices um and it's you know it starts off slow you know a few years ago it was just like there's no uh, concept, you know, as far as the general public on these things, and I think it's grown more and more every year. And we just have to just constantly be beating that down, in, beating that in everyone's head, talking to the dispensaries, um, just letting everyone demanding it as a consumer. Um, but the more people come in contact and learn about these things, there's only one direction. Nobody's all of a sudden like, no, nah, I'm going to go back to that, you know, Kemi Indoor because that was working for me, <laughs> like this regen thing. Nah. Uh, there's only one direction. I've never seen anyone like who really gets to like know the quality of, of living soil, sun grown, like amazing genetics, of course, to go with it too. But like once you've experienced that, you know, there's, there's not really backwards so I think it's a constant slope and it's all of us constantly talking to each other uh, about supporting each other and and bringing each other up it has to be mutualistic so much business it's like you know cutting the other person down and why you're the best and it's not like that in this movement it's why you know it's like supporting everyone's practices and because there's there's stuff to be learned from everyone and and so celebrating the differences and the diversity and how that makes us stronger um, so just as a group, just constantly putting out the education um, and, and hopefully the public supporting that. 
It definitely feels like a David and Goliath situation, and it's like, oh man, there's so much indoor. Everyone like they think, okay, something costs more to produce, therefore it's more expensive, therefore it must be better, and that's really frustrating to to see that attitude be so prevalent. But at the same time, watching this movement grow, and it, it's really been pretty rapid and amazing. And it, it's it's really true that basically all you have to do is just like smoke it once, and you'll make an effort to look for it in the future. And so the more people that just know that this exists and get a chance to try it, the more it will become available because the demand just, it, it, like Jesse said, you don't go in the opposite direction once you go this way. Yeah, I think the quality is what's really going to help us prevail because you know, one thing that I've noticed, and, and as I've become a farmer and when I drink wine, I notice this too, is that people who use the same things, all their stuff tastes the same. And so how do you differentiate yourself in the market when you're using the same recipe as 6,000 other people or more? <laughs> and so when you are bringing out a unique quality of your place that doesn't taste like anybody else's place, you know, whether you're trying to get a lower price and produce more and, and you know, process it in a, in a more, you know, quick manner or you're trying to do a smaller batch that you're trying to really, you know, train those plants and, and produce a quality a product that's equal to what people expect of a top shelf indoor that's, you know, finely manicured and, and taken care of. Um, you know, basically, that quality, quality is going to differentiate you because your land is different from everybody else's land. And whether you advertise your practices or not, that quality is going to help you distinguish yourself. And so we as a society and as an industry need to focus on quality um, above and beyond, absolutely. And, and diversity. So uh, not just like growing tons of the same di different, uh, same clones, you know, like seeds, they all have different phenotypes. So each phenotype is special. So each plant is, you know, should be held to its full, you know, be being, you know, it's, it's one seed. It's, it's not like any other, it's like a snowflake, you know, so it, it has all different properties and, uh, having diversity like that, it, it, it could be a way. We've, yeah, keeping I mean, it like, a niche market. Yeah, exactly. It's it's about the niche market, which I mean, as as an industry, as a retail sp market space, as as a regulatory policy. There's um, as far as you know, all of these things, as far as like the the ability of the small farmer or small business to operate as a regular small business, we have no direct retail access. There's you have to be vertically integrated. There's all these different things that don't make sense that we're doing in our industry that aren't even standard in all other industries and the markups and the the way the, who has to take what cut out of where and it, none of it makes any sense. It's like we've been talking all weekend about how crazy this is that we're all doing this, but but at the same time. They're, you know, the people who want the good weed and you know it. And back in the day, you know, you would get that amazing bag and you, it would just come to you magically because you didn't have control over what you would get necessarily. Maybe you knew a guy or your friend's cousin or whatever if you were lucky. But, but you know, like you got this ma magic bag of weed and it was incredible and you were like, whoa. And one day we actually met the people that <laughs> grew our weed and... It changed our lives forever and just, I mean, like with wine, we, we have a level of sophistication with the consumer now where you can have that niche market really thrive and it's going to take time. I mean, we don't even have our appellations set at this point. Like it's, it's going to be difficult and we're at the beginning of a, of a long road of development as far as that and as far as consumer education and as far as all of these things. But there is a very, very strong desire from all demographics of consumers realistically for things that are 
natural, that are pure, that are healthy, that are actually legitimately clean, and that are going to enhance their health because I think the latest statistic I heard was like one in two people in the U.S. now have cancer. It's one in two. So it's, it's again, it just goes back to how all those things are connected, but there are, there's a, there's a, a bridge that we still have to build and then get across, and we're at the beginning of that right now. And there, that, that's just real reality. But we live really sustainably on our farms, so we're going to be all right. <laughs> we're going to ride it out, you know, for however long and whatever is going to happen after that. Like, I'd rather be on my farm than anywhere if the shit hits the fan, you know. But but we want to help help it thrive and we, we want to help it move along as quickly as possible and consumer advocacy and awareness or consumer awareness and just how we get the knowledge out there is really what this movement is about and what regenerativecanvasfarming.org is about and why the Emerald Cup made it such a priority to create an award specifically for how the farms are practicing and, and really centering around why that makes what we do up here in Northern California so special and why our s that creates a uniqueness to our story that is definitely marketable. And uh, the challenge is, yeah, there's you know a lot of capital going into all kinds of things right now and it's gonna be a shit show for a while. So it's really about like finding the other people on the other side that are all part of this, that, that, that care, because definitely people all over the place really care. Well, Forrest, me Forrest was mentioning, oh really? <laughs> uh, the diversity, oh, hold on. <laughs> Forrest was mentioning the diversity, or, or the, um, the uniqueness and the potential of that flower. Um, and you know, like, this jar, what's in it is it's, it's high art, and it can only exist this year in this way. You know, like it's it's very unique. That genetic expression in that environment from that has the love of the cultivator in it, as well as uh, a a diverse living system around it that it came to existence to then change your consciousness, like. I don't know, we're talking about things that change our consciousness. Like, let's like let's care about the process that went into creating this. Like, this is incredibly special art to me. Um, and I love I love cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I think we're out of time, but these guys are all incredibly generous. If you find them and ask them questions, I'm sure they'll talk to you for a long time and tell you a lot of valuable information. Um, but since we're Don't out of time, can we just uh, can you, since we're not on Instagram right now, maybe everyone could say where people can buy your flowers, if they're available anywhere. Does anyone can anyone find anyone's flowers in a store and buy they're them all, if they want to? They're all at Soulful, right? Every one of these farms is Soulful. I think, yeah, I think we're all, all of us are at Soulful in Sebastopol, and we want to thank those guys for doing a lot of the work to find the people really doing the work on the other side. Proper wellness um, for us in Eureka and um, the Kohong in, in Oakland, which is a micro business that um, has been very fair trade with us. And so we want to thank them for, for their support as well. So I also want to thank, I saw her out here earlier, Amber Center, who's just starting up her business leisure life doing pre rolls. She's a small, these are the kind of people we want to support that are small, um, not big time invested, and we're we're all learning about this too. Just smaller um, investors and companies that uh, care and make a difference and make a difference in their communities as well, not just on the bigger level and out of state. And uh, chemistry is doing really great work with the vape um, cartridges and working with really. Um, find boutique regenerative farms and they do like whole plant um, whole plant extract so it's really wonderful thanks everyone smoke regenerative weed <laughs>